I am Andrea Ferretti. I'm from the research and development group in Unicredit, uh, where we do a lot of stuff uh, with uh, big data, machine learning, uh, in mostly in Scala. But today I'm here to talk about something uh, slightly different, which is essentially what happens uh, when you're really, really started and insist in using function composition as a basic building block for programming. So I will start with a quote that uh, means that restrictions can foster creativity. And this has happened in many situations. For instance, this is a famous book by Georges Perec, La Disparition. It is a book uh, uh, which is written uh, all without ever using the letter E. And uh, of, of course, this is quite not trivial to do, but uh, he managed to do and uh, it is an, a not worthy piece, piece of writing. And the decaphonic music, there uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, pe people at the 20th century, people were uh, trying to make melodies, trying never to repeat a note with, uh, without uh, having before used all the other 11 notes. So the, the only allowed way to combine notes would be to use them all uh, in circles with possible superposition. And this has led to, uh, it is an artificial restriction, but has led to a whole new genre of music. Or for another instance, there is this artist, is uh, Phil Hansen. Uh, he wanted to do pointillism, where you, you draw stuff just with little dots, but he had the tremor in his hands, and so he decided not to use uh, dots, but to use little, little lines, which were easier, easier for, for him, and he became quite famous using a different style, which, I mean, he had this restriction, and he used it for, for its own advantage. So, another typical situation where we have a, a restriction but it can become a strength, is in functional programming itself, where, for instance, you can insist never to mutate values, and that makes some stuff harder, but also uh, allows you to better reason about your programs. Or maybe uh, you, you, you want to avoid doing side effects, but you want to describe side effects and compose them. So you dedicate a type, I.O., to the description of side effects. And that leads to a new, different style of programming. So I want also to start with uh, a provocation, a restriction. So what happens if everything you have in your language is a function? And not only that, the only thing you're allowed to do with these functions is compose them. Because in a certain sense also, in Haskell, there is no real distinction between function and values because you can think as values as uh, zero-ary functions, functions that are constant. But here I'm talking about something slightly different, uh, actual functions. So what happens if your only building block is composition? Well. There is an issue, of course, because uh, functions may have different uh, arity, so it may, may not always be possible to compose them. We have seen an example uh, today during the keynote where changing the signatures of some function made it impossible to compose them. And uh, the way that Haskell proposes to combine them with a function which is slightly different from composition, which is monadic composition. But we are sturdy, and so we actually want to use composition. So, when you compose functions, uh, well, you see, assume your program is just doing by composing one function after the other. So it means that the input of, say, G there is the output of F. So G cannot see anything but what is output by F. So if there is some values that are computed before, in some step that comes before here to the left. Well, that value has to be threaded by F. 
and pass by to G because G cannot see anything but its input. And the same, whatever G discards here will never be seen by H. So we, we ran into s some strange contradiction because we, we wanted to do something functional, but it seems that the only way to do function composition is to have uh, essentially just one piece of information which you can think as the global state and to thread it function by function. So there is just the global state that goes into F. F outputs a new global state and that is the input to G. And uh, well, th th this seems a really bad idea, but it turns out maybe it's not that bad. So what we do is to use a global data structure to thread state. Now when we think of global state, usually we think of key value maps. So global state means uh, global variables, so variables have names. And so to the key, which is the name of the variable, you have associated the, the name, the value of the variable. So it seems that a key value map, a hash map, is the ideal structure to thread this state. But uh, of course we, we know that this does not really work. So we, we go back to the programming of uh, I mean, global variables like we used to do in, I don't know, Fortran? Uh, it, well, well, they used to do like this before I was even born. So, And there is no really good way to enforce encapsulation because the, the very property of key value maps, of hash maps, is that you have uh, random access to any piece of the data structure. So if you have random access to any piece of the data structure, you do not know any function which part of this state will access. And if you do not know which part of the state will access, you, you have no way to enforce encapsulation. Every function sees everything and there is no way to, to, to do something meaningful. So what is the solution that I well, it's not me, but that I want to show today. Well, something that works is changing the data structures that encode the global state and use a stack. So a stack is something where you can push a value on top and you can uh, pop a value from the stack, but you cannot access something that it's not on top of the stack. So you, in theory, have a disposition uh, all the global state. But in practice, uh, it's not like that because uh, you can access the top value on the stack, but not the value that are lower than that. So this is what I was saying. Of course, uh, uh, we may need to access some values that are under the, the top uh, of the stack. So maybe we will need some primitives to uh, I don't know, swap the first two values on the stacks or do some operations that expose some values that are under the top of the stack. But, well, the fact is that the, the farther a value is from the top of the stack and the hardest it becomes to reach it. So uh, we, are, we are all lazy. So we will tend to use more the values that are on top of the stack and use less the values that are second and third, and nobody goes lower than that because it's it's a mess. So while we have um, maybe a very complex stack with uh, no hundreds of values, actually at each point in time we only see the top of the stack. So in a sense there is no distinction between uh, global and local variables, but uh, variables that are highest on the stack are more local, while va uh, variables that are farther from the stack are just inaccessible in a sense. So there is a scale of locality, okay? So what do you do when you program like that? Well, I will present Factor. Uh, Factor is a nifty little language. It's not very popular, but it's still the most mainstream of this family. So, it's a, it's a whole different way of thinking about programming, which is, is called concatenative programming, where 
it, it is to be contraposed to applicative programming. In concatenative programming, you just concatenate functions. You never look at values. While in applicative programming, like the lambda calculus, is all about applying functions to values and doing stuff like better reduction in, in lambda calculus. So what what uh, comes out out of this uh, process is something that has uh, at least three different ways to look at it. From a certain point of view, you get what I described up until now. So it's a language that is pure, it's based on function, and it resembles very closely uh, Haskell when you are really hardcore and you always do point-free programming uh, and you never mention the, the values of your functions. But since you're just pipelining functions one after the other, it looks, uh, in a sense, very imperative. It's like you do this, then you do that, then you do that, then you do that. You're just composing steps. So it also resembles Bash in a certain sense because uh, it's a little like what happens if you take uh, Bash pipes and you apply them at the level of single expression, single statements. So when when you have uh, programs in Bash. You can take the output of one program and feed it in as the input of the next program. And this is very convenient to do some simple pipelines, but the single program is still implemented usually in C or something like that. And uh, here we go further than that and we do this on a micro scale. A third way to do this is, uh, well, essentially you have no syntax when you do that because uh, well, you, are, you only have one operation, so you just do not have need for syntax. So you do stuff one after the other, so there, there, will, no, there will be no, no syntax ever. And uh, this is, uh, is very convenient, because since uh, every program is a, a, a list of things to do, it's very easy to, to do metaprogramming and to manipulate it. And there are facilities to introduce your little pieces of syntax uh, to embed, say, a little DSL. And it will mostly not interfere with the flow of the program, which, has, which is syntaxless. And we will see this because the, we will see something that resembles syntax, but it turns out you could have written as a library. So it's like a Lisp on steroids. But, well, I'm not here to talk about Factor. I actually want to show what it's like to program in Factor. So I will start from some basic examples and try to do a little live demo. So, when you... When you open the factor for the first time, you, you get something which looks like this. Maybe I can just increase the font size. Okay, can you see this? It's readable. Uh, I think. It's a little inconvenient for me. I, I just switched the, the display so that it's double display because otherwise I cannot see what I'm doing. Okay, I, I think this is this is double display. Okay, so uh, we will start uh, to, to to write something here and see what happens. So, the first thing I will write is something like five. So, what is five as a function? Well, we can think uh, uh, literals like functions. Uh, even more. Okay. Is this better? Even okay. 
So what is a value like, I don't know, five? Well, five, uh, it's a literal, but you can think of five as a function that when you execute it, pushes the literal five on the stack. So when we do like that, we get something on the stack, and the stack is displayed just there. It's five. And we can put under number or, I don't know, 16. And we, uh, you see, uh, uh, Everything is just space separated, so all tokens uh, are, are valid, provided they are separated by spaces. So we can keep pushing numbers on the stack, but well, we may want to do something more interesting. So the first operation that we may want to do is, uh, I don't know, addition. Addition is, of course, a plus. So addition is a function that takes two values from the stack and pushes their sum on the stack. So if we perform addition, we get 19 and five is uh, there, it's just untouched by addition. Or say multiplication, 95. Now this is uh, uh, not particularly fancy. We could of course write everything in one line, the, the listener, which is this interface that does not complain. Okay, now we clear the stack and we try to do something slightly more complicated. And the first example may be the, the factorial. So how do we do the factorial? Uh, well, let's start from uh, from a simple uh, from a simple example. Let's do the factorial of 12. Okay. So we'd rather we'd better have 12 on the stack. Okay. The factorial now is the product of the numbers from 1 to, to 12. So the first thing to do is to have the numbers from 1 to 12 on the stack, and then take their product. Because the, the way you go reasoning about programs here is always by composing little steps. So the first step is to have the numbers from 1 to 12. Well, I will spare you that there is a, a function to, to do this. It's like a range. Uh, well, it is slightly convenient, the, the fact that the tokens are just space separated, which means that uh, you can use uh, whatever, uh, whatever characters you like for your functions. So the, the way that, that a range is represented in, uh, in factor is just like this, A, B. So if I do, let me do this, 12, 18, and then I do A, B, what I get is uh, the interval going from 12 to 18 which is convenient because I, I don't have to remember whether it's open or not. Uh, it depends on how I put the, the brackets. With the closed brackets, the closed range. Now this is not imported and uh, the system suggests me to import the range's vocabulary. Uh, by the way, vocabulary, why? Uh, because since everything you have is written uh, one function after the other, the factor as its uh, terminology Functions are just called words, because you do one word after the other. And so the modules that collect functions that are defined in terms of other functions, so words that are defined in terms of other words, are called vocabularies. So what, if I do that, A, B, what I get here is, uh, well, some kind of a opaque structure. With, it's not clear if it's the list of numbers from 12 to 18. But still, it's nice that we can inspect it. It seems that it's something of class range, uh, and it has some attributes. It goes from 12 as length 7. But this is one th nice thing of, about factor is that it's very useful for doing uh, exploratory data analysis because you can do a lot of operations and just inspect stuff uh, visually. Uh, to convince you that it, this is actually the, the list of numbers, I will convert it to an array, so we see it looks like the numbers from 12 to 18. So let me drop this, and then I will go into, so I wanted to have the list of numbers from one to 10, and for that there is a, a function which is called just one B, because A is fixed to one. Okay, so this, I have the numbers from one to 12 here, and now I want to take the product. Now the product, uh, where we are functional programmers, so it's a fold, a reduce. Uh, you take a list and you reduce it, starting from one and applying multiplication. So let us see if we find something, F1. 
is glad to document uh, every function that I have uh, available. So it turns out there is a function called reduce. It takes a sequence, and I have one. It takes an identity, and the identity that for multiplication is one. And it takes, uh, say, a quotation, which is not clear what is at this point, but it has to be the, the operation, which has to be the multiplication. And it returns the result. So I can do this. I put one on the stack. And then I have to put multiplication. Unfortunately, if I just do this, uh, the system will give me an error because I'm not pushing the concept of multiplication on the stack. I'm applying the function multiplication, which does not work. It's trying to multiply this list by this number. So I need a way to quote the, the fact that I'm using multiplication without applying it. And there is a mechanism called quotation, which essentially consists in writing your functions into bracket like that. It's like an anonymous function in, in other programming languages. So now that I have everything on the stack, I can just reduce it, and I get my number, which is the factorial of 12. So just to make sure that, uh, uh, I mean, everything works, let me rewrite it uh, just in one line. So I had 12. I have this operation 1B that makes the list of numbers up to 12. Then I have 1. I have multiplication and reduce. Now, the, the nice uh, thing about this is that this sequence of stuff is something that I can split wherever I want. Because of this compositionality, uh, it's very easy to factor out parts of the, of the operation. For instance, I could have written first 12, then 1b, 1, uh, and the multiplication, and finally reduce or whatever. I can split these five uh, tokens in the way I want. So it's very easy when we have some complex operation to just cut a part of the operation, give it a name, and uh, substitute literally the, that name for the operation. So th this is not something that you do easily in other programming languages because when you factor out a part of your code, you have to rename local variables and uh, you have to ensure that everything you have is passed the, to, the, to the function that you're extracting. But it comes for free in this language. This is why it's called factor, because you can always factor out stuff easily. But still, we have not defined our first function. So let us define it. I will introduce something that looks like syntax, but uh, we will see it. it really it's not. So we define a factorial function. It's introduced by a column. Then there is something like this here. So uh, I have a parenthesis. Then some name for the inputs. It doesn't really matter what the name is. The only thing that counts is the number of inputs. There's, there's just one input, and I will call it n, but it's ignored by the compiler. And one output separated by dashes. And uh, again, it doesn't matter what the name of the output is. I choose N uh, with the uh, exclam exclamation mark, which is the usual name, but it doesn't matter. And then I, I, I do the definition. So what I have to do if I have N on the stack and want N factorial on the stack? Well, I do what I have been doing just right now. So I take 1B and then 1 multiplication and reduce. And I end with the, uh, what's the name? Semicolon. Semicolon. Thank you. <laughs> so this is our first definition, and we can check that it uh, works like, like, like this. The, the nice thing uh, uh, about the, the whole interface is that the, the, the system now knows about the factorial function. And for, ex for instance, we can find its definition in the help system, which is quite, uh, quite uh, convenient when you're doing stuff interactively. Uh, so l l let us see in action that maybe this definition is slightly complicated. So the, uh, when I described factorial, there really were only two steps. First, you take the list of numbers up to that number, and then the product. So maybe we can factor out these three steps, one times reduce as the product. So let, let's do that. 
we define the product of some numbers, say x1, uh, xn, and it will return x1 times xn. Really, th this, uh, these are just names that I'm making up. And I can write it whatever I want as long as I do not use spaces. The, num the name of the input is, uh, well, some numbers, x1, xn, the name of the output is their product. And the product is just what I've written, 1 times reduce. And uh, this helps me writing the factorial so I can refactor the factorial and write something like, like before, but now it's just the list of number up the, the range up to n and then the product. And again it works. So you, you see it was very easy to factor out this part of, uh, of, uh, of the definition just by copying it uh, literally here. So uh, I've mentioned that there is no syntax but it looks like there is quite a lot of syntax, so it's not true that whatever token is applied to the to the stack in in turn. For instance, we have seen that these uh, brackets here have some meanings, so I cannot just write bracket here. It does not make sense. And also the colon introduces a definition, but these are called parsing words. You can define your own parsing words. And when you define, we will see an example in a minute. When you define a parsing word, you interact with the parser and you can say to the parser, okay, give me one more token or what have you, what, uh, have you accumulated right now, okay? Add this thing to the stack of things that you accumulated or give me three more tokens and do whatever you want. And then you say, okay, I'm finished. And uh, what you output is what gets on the stack. So you can define a little syntax yourself. And uh, in fact, uh, we can see that this, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm able to, okay, let me just look for it in the help system. You see this is defined. This is the, defi the word that introduces definition for words is itself defined. It's a, something that you can write in a library. And the only thing that is really primitive is this thing here. Syntax uh, colon is the way to define new syntax, including the syntax for defining new words. And everything starts from here. The module system is based on this idea of metaprogramming. The object system based on this idea of metaprogramming and so on. So, I would like to give a uh, slightly more complex example, but to do so I must introduce some library words. Well, you see, one thing that you often have to do is shuffle stuff that it's on the, on the stack, which is inconvenient because we do not really want to think about the stack. We want to think about the composition of function, and the stack is much of a detail. But, uh, well, it's there, so sometimes you need to do stuff with it. So there are a few words that rearrange things on the stacks. For instance, swap, that swaps the two top values on the stacks, or rot, that rotates three values on the stacks, drop, that eliminates the top value on the stack, and there are a few other words like this, but I do not really want to go into this. I just want to mention that they are there. What is usually more convenient is to encapsulate some, uh, some common ways of reasoning about your program, of doing some, some common patterns into their own words. And I will show just uh, the only one that, uh, that I need, which is called by. And as far as I know, this does not have an analog in, uh, in other programming language. It's something that you use when you want to apply two functions to a value. So say I have a value on the stack, like, I don't know, 8, and I want to sum 3, but I also want to subtract 4. These are two quotations, 
The first contains the operation of summing three and the second contains the operation of uh, uh, subtracting four. Of course, uh, uh, you see that arithmetic is a, l a little inconvenient in factor because, uh, because the way are, uh, are done, uh, you get that uh, arithmetic is postfix, which uh, takes a little while to, to get it. But you, you, there, are, there are libraries to use uh, infix uh, arithmetics if you want. Uh, you can define your own syntax, so there, you can do that with the libraries. Still, if we have those two operations, there is one of the most used word in factor, which is by, which uh, allows you to apply those two operations to the value and get back uh, 11 and 4, respectively. So you see uh, functions in general have a different number of inputs, but also a different number of outputs. By, in this case, has two outputs. So. Uh, th there's really a symmetry here. So uh, I want to try a little harder algorithm, which is k-means. And just to show how simple it is to do that uh, in, in a few lines in, in this language. So how many of you have uh, know, know or have heard of the k-means clustering algorithm? Okay, a, a few people know it. but. Uh, I will try to I will try to give a little introduction. So what is k means? K means uh, you have some points in space. We, w we will work in the plane actually. And uh, what you want to do is to do clustering. So you want to group them together to uh, Nearby points should end nearby. So the way we do this is very simple. We start uh, choosing k random points. For instance, they may be chosen from the actual points or chosen random. And then we group points into cluster based on which of those centroids is, is the closest one. When we've done that, we have some groups, some cluster of points. And we update the centroids. We take the average of each cluster to be the new centroid. And we repeat and we repeat the operation until convergence. So this is a little illustration. So we, we start, we have those points that are the gray dots. And we have the red and blue and green dots chosen randomly. Then we divide the space and we choose the points that are closer to the red dot, which is just this one, the points that are closer to the green ones, just this one, and same for the blue. And we update the centroids. The, cent new, cent the new red centroid is the, well, just this point. The new green centroid is the average of these points, and same for the blue. And we get three new clusters, and, and go on doing this. So back to live coding. Let us try to do this together. So the first thing uh, I would do is to look for something like uh, vector arithmetic, because we have to sum and divide vectors. And uh, well, we are lucky. There are already functions to do vector arithmetic, which are called just v plus, uh, v divided, uh, and uh, so it's like the plus, minus, and, but prefixed by v. So we can do something like this. These are two vectors, and we can sum them using the math vectors vocabulary. By the way, this, this already is not syntax. This, uh, this left bracket, which introduces array, it's defined in its own library. You can define your own data structures with your own literals. So what we want to do, so we, we have to find the average of points. So to define the average of points, we first have to find the sum of points. And this is not much different from the factorial that we've done. So we define the sum of points to be a point. And what we do is, uh, well, we start from uh, the origin. We uh, apply an operation which is uh, now we know called v plus, the sum of vectors, and we do reduce. So we have defined the way to sum a bunch of points. So we can also take the average of a bunch of points. And the average of a, 
some points looks like this. Well, the average of points is the sum divided by the length. So it's not much difficult. We do the sum, we do the length, and we do the division. Well, well we do by to perform both operations on our input. And when we have both the sum and the length on the stack, we will do the division. So this is the average. And so if we have some clusters, which are arrays of vectors, we can find their centroids. So we have some clusters. This will get the centroids. And how will it look? OK, for each cluster, we have to do the same operation, which is the average. So it's just a map. So it looks like average map. We apply map passing the anonymous function average here. So given the clusters, we are able to find our centroids. So what uh, we need now, it's a way uh, to find the closest uh, centroid to a point and group points by their closest centroid. So let's just do this. The closest centroid to a point looks like this. So I have a bunch of points, like P's, and I also have a point Q, and I want to find which of the P's is closest to Q. So I will need to use the distance. And uh, well, I will not show it, but there is a function just called distance, which does the distance on vectors. And the distance is a function of two arguments, and I have on the stack this Q, so I can partially apply the distance to get a function of just one argument, which is the distance from Q. And this is done by the word carry. So now I have the points, and I have the distance from Q, which is a function, and I just, well, there are a few library functions, of course, infimum by, which is, is what would be called minby in other languages, takes the minimum of a list based on a function. So I've defined the closest point, and now I have to define how to get uh, the actual clusters of points. So I have the points on the stack, I have some centroids on the stacks, and I want to find the clusters. Well, I have to group the point by their closest centroid. So I have the closest function, which is a function of two arguments, and I have the centroids. And uh, what, to do, what do I do? It's the same thing, I carry it. So I, the closest function is a function of two arguments, and uh, if I partially apply it to centroids, I will get the function which gives me the closest centroid. So this is what I do. There is a swap here just because the arguments are in the different order, but never mind. And I carry it. So this is the, uh, is the function that gives me the closest centroid. So I have the points, I have the function that returns the closest centroid, and I can do a group by, to group the functions by their closest centroid. This will give me a hash map, each centroid points to the list of points that are closest to him. And uh, I just don't care for the centroids, I care for the clusters, so I take the values of this hash map. And this is, oh, okay, it's not group by, it's collect by. Well. And so I have defined how to do the clusters. And well, we're almost done. So. What does it look uh, a step in k-means? I have some clusters at, at a certain point, and I want the next clusters. What do I need to do? Well, I, I know, I have a function here that gives me the next cluster. It is enough for me to have the points and the centroids. Well, if I have the clusters, I can get the points just by uh, forgetting one dimension just by putting together all the points in all the clusters, concatenating together all the, all the vectors in those arrays. And this is by, done with concat. The other th uh, function, which given the function, the cluster gives me the centroids, is there. 
I've already written it. I do these two things, and when I have the two uh, the points and the centroids on the stack, I do the operation I did before, and this gives me the clusters. So this is a step. Well, it's a little small to see. And then I have to do something at, at the beginning. I will just have the, the, the initial points and the number of centroids. So I have to choose some random points. This is not really important, but if I have P's and N and I want to get the first clusters, what, uh, well, I can just duplicate the points. So I have the points, the points, and N. And with the points and then I can choose the first n points using the head function. And this will be good enough to, to be the starting point. So this will be the centroids. And when I have the points and the centroids, I can do the first clusters. So this is the initial step. And we're done. The, the last line puts everything together. So to do actually k-means, we will choose a number of iterations. We have a points and the numbers of clusters that we want to get and returns the clusters. And what we do is, well, we have the points and then we just do, do the first step to get the clusters. And once we have that, we repeat a number of times the, uh, so, sorry, this is came in start. When we have done that, we have the clusters on the stack and we repeat the step a certain number of times. And uh, repeat. And this is, uh, well, if we get, it should be like this, it's eight lines to, to define k-means in a, in a way that I think it's fairly, uh, respects fairly the structure that we think about the problem like in just one step after the other. And it's also quite efficient. We can try it on, uh, on some points I have here. I can read this file file contents. This is just a, a, file, a JSON file containing uh, 100,000 points and uh, I can parse them. I will use the json.reader module. So this function json arrow parses json and returns a data structure in factor. So I have this uh, this big array with uh, 100,000 uh, elements, we can inspect them. And once we have this, uh, well, we, we need to, I don't know, make 15 iterations. We have 15, we have the points, we need to know the number of cluster, we can take 10. And we can try our implementation of, of k-means. I will de use this control T, which just times the the operation, and it returns in, well, less than three seconds, it was able to do clustering on 100,000 points, which is not bad, considering that the language is completely dynamic, and there is a custom virtual machine, so it's really quite performant to be a, a niche project. This is the result, and I even get something like, I don't know, GC summary, which tells me if I want to optimize for performance, it tells me what happened during garbage collection events. There, there is a lot of stuff that you can do to inspect uh, the, this stuff. And this is just a little, little example of how this style of programming looks like. And uh, I really do not have uh, much more time now, but I will suggest just some resources. So. The, there is a factor code is where you you can find factor itself. Concatenative.org is a, a quite ugly, but the the only site that collects resources about concatenative programming. Then there is a tutorial that you find on my GitHub, and then there are a number of blogs. With the the main blog is refactor.blogspot.it, which collects a, 
a little, well, many little nifty utilities uh, or little stuff done in, in Factor which are very useful to, to get started. And, uh, well, I, I've only scratched the surface of what one can do. In fact, there are a lot of other things. If, if you see my tutorial, the, the, I go from there to, to, to servers and channels and actors and distributed computing. But, of course, I do not have time to do all of this live, but it, it can be done. And, um, uh, well, I confess that I'm not using factor that much in production, but it has shaped the way I look uh, at programming uh, in, in a very strong way. For, for instance, ju just to mention the, the last minute, the, um, what we have seen today uh, in, the, in the keynote was uh, a way where there was a trouble composing functions because when, we, when you added the logging to a function, suddenly you could not compose it anymore. And this is something that just does not happen here. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a really, an, I, I do, not, do not have time, but I, I have tried to, to reproduce the example uh, of today and you can really go from functions without logging and add logging to a function just with metaprogramming and make so that each function logs and they still do compose like they used to do before. Even if the functions just are functions from one argument and look at the top of the stack. So uh, I think uh, it's valuable to, to look at this uh, even only for, I mean, for culture and for, for a different perspective. So.